What's the difference between Iron Man and Aluminum Man? Iron Man stops the villains, but Aluminum Man just foils their plans. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, Iron Man, Hulk, and Captain America all walk into Ikea. Avengers, assemble! Oh, Marvel jokes are the best. Okay, eighth grade. Today we are starting with our next Catholic letter. Um, so we just finished the letter of Jude. Now we'll be moving into the first letter of St. John. So remember that Catholic letters are a term that we give to the seven New Testament epistles that were definitely not written by St. Paul. Right. And there's a few other differences between the Catholic letters and the 14 other epistles. Um, but um, yeah, the basic thing you need to know right now is that Catholic letters are just the seven epistles we know for sure were not written by St. Paul. All right. Um, so first John. First John is a letter written at the end of the first century. So so sometime around the year 95 or 96 AD, some people think it was written in 97, 98, or 99, but most say 95 or 96 AD, written by St. John the Apostle. He was um, the author of the book of Revelation and also the author of the gospel of St. John. So it's that same John. All right, so who was this guy? Uh, St. John the Apostle was Jesus' closest friend and companion. He was significantly younger than Jesus. We think he was probably about 14 years younger than Jesus, maybe even younger than that. So that's why he lives until the end of uh, the first century. Uh, so this apostle uh, was present at the foot of the cross when Jesus dies. Like I said, he authors the gospel and the, the book of Revelation, AKA the apocalypse. And he also authors three of the seven Catholic letters. So he writes quite a bit of the New Testament for us. Um, John the Apostle is also the only apostle not to die a violent death. So Judas commits suicide. The 10 other apostles are all martyred. John is not martyred, right? Actually, he's something we call a white martyr, but you don't need to know what that means. John is not killed for his faith. Instead, he is exiled for much of his life on an island called Patmos. Um, but then at the end of his life, there is a new Roman emperor who allows John, um, allows a lot of the exiles to return from exile. And from that point on, he lives in Ephesus, which is a city in Asia Minor where he writes his three Catholic letters at the end of his life. All right, so why is John writing this letter? Um, well, he's writing his letter to the entire Christian church. So this is another thing that distinguishes the Catholic letters from Paul's epistles. Mostly, Paul's epistles are written for a specific person or group of Christians whereas the Catholic letters are written mostly for Christians in general. There's a couple exceptions to this, but they're generally written for the whole church in general. The authors intend them, them to be passed around the entire church. Um, so he writes this letter to warn them about the influence of false teachers. Does that ring a bell? It should, because that's similar to what Jude is writing about. Um, so John wants to point out uh, the errors that these false teachers are making in their teaching. And he also wants to encourage Christians to persevere in their Christian faith, to continue to live holy, moral lives. Um, John also wants to protect the teachings of Christianity about who Christ is. Uh, and the reason he wants to do this is because a lot of the false teachers that John is worried about are um, heretics, or they're not heretics, they're, um, they're outside of the church, so they're not heretics. They're false teachers who support an ideology called Serinthianism. Serinthianism is a heresy because it's supported by some members of the early church. It's a heresy that rejects 
the incarnation. And it says that the person of Jesus and the second person of the Trinity, the Christ, are two different entities, right? So let's get more into detail about what, what Serinthianism is. Oh, by the way, this is what's left of Ephesus. Or is that Patmos? Oh, shoot, I forget now. I think this is what's left of Ephesus today. I could be wrong. This could be Patmos. Um, but, you know, we still have ruins of these real places, so you could actually, like, go and visit them. It's kind of cool. All right. So what is Serinthianism? Like, we need to get more into it. So Serinthianism is a Gnostic heresy. So Gnostic uh, refers to a large group of heresies that were around at that time. And actually, Gnostic heresies still exist today. They've existed throughout the church's history. Um, Serinthians are Gnostics. So Gnostics are people who uh, reject uh, the idea that God and matter could be the same thing. So Gnostics generally believe that matter, material things, are bad, right? And Christians, of course, the, the church has always taught in Genesis, whatever God creates is good. Right? So Gnostics look at the world and they say, well, there's a lot of bad stuff in the world. Therefore, um, some of the things God made must be bad. Right? Uh, and, and that is uh, the opposite of what Catholics believe and Christians believe. We believe everything God made is good. Right? So Gnostics reject that teaching. Uh, and Serinthianism is a form of Gnosticism. Um, so Serinthians say, because matter is bad, it is not possible for God, who is perfectly good, to so weaken himself as to take on a material form, a body of flesh and blood, right? God would never become matter, right? And so, therefore, the incarnation is not possible. That's what Serinthians believe. Right, so instead, they believe that Jesus was just a regular baby when he was born. Joseph was his biological father. Mary was his biological mother. Jesus was born. Uh, and then um, at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit carries the second person of the Trinity into Jesus, and Jesus becomes the Christ. Right, so... Serinthians believe that Jesus was like a really saintly, holy man, and that at his baptism, uh, he, wanted, he went to John the Baptist to be baptized, and because he was so holy, the second person of the Trinity decided to kind of like inhabit or possess his body, right? Uh, I know this is kind of weird, but heresies are very weird. Um, so Jesus' body, according to Serinthians, was just kind of like a host or a carrier for God. And then at the crucifixion, uh, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And Serinthians believe that means that Jesus realized that the second person of the Trinity left him. Right. So they believe uh, the second person of the Trinity was in Jesus' body from the baptism all the way to the crucifixion. All right? So this is a heresy. The church rejects it. Um, now, I do want to talk a little bit about other Gnostics. Right? So Gnostics is a big umbrella term referring to anyone who thinks that matter is bad. It's a little more complicated than that, but um, they are heretics. Uh, Gnostics teach that they have special knowledge of God, right? Gnostic comes from a Greek word, gnosis, which is where we get the word knowledge. So they believe they have a special knowledge of God separate from what the church teaches, right? And they're very, very dangerous <coughs> because um, they present themselves as Christians, as believers in, in God, in the Trinity, in the resurrection, <clears throat> in the forgiveness of sins, right? But they're really dangerous, right? And John recognizes this, and the church still recognizes this today, right? There's a lot, if you look at these pictures here, uh, these talk about 
uh, Gnostic beliefs, right? There's the belief in Gnostic gospels and that Jesus had all these secret teachings. This is a, a fake Gnostic or the real Gnostic altar, right? Where a, a sacrilegious uh, mass would be said, right? So Gnosticism still exists today and it tries to pull people away from Christianity because Christians look at Gnostics and they say, oh yeah, some of that makes sense. They believe in Jesus, they're holy. Gnostics in Jesus' time, however, or in the time of John, uh, were dangerous because they taught they didn't have to follow the Ten Commandments and that Christians don't have to follow certain moral laws, right? Because they believe that Jesus' death saved people, but his blood did not. So they believe his blood did not save people um, because... Christ left Jesus' body before the crucifixion, so his blood would just be regular blood. But they believe that the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross freed us from all the Old Testament laws, including the Ten Commandments, and also laws about um, morality, right? So Gnostics during this time were very unholy people, uh, especially when it came to uh, issues of sexual morality. All right, so John writes his letter to teach Christians how to unite themselves to God, which would be like the opposite of what Serinthian would say. And a Christian would do this through something called caritas, which is Christian love, or it's also translated as charity. And this means it's a word that means you love God and you love your neighbor out of your love for God. So the reason you love your neighbor is not for your neighbor's sake, but because you love God so much and your neighbor is part of God's creation that therefore you love your neighbor, right? That is a Christian teaching, caritas. And so the practice of caritas, John says, allows us to unite ourselves to God because of the incarnation. And this matters because the blood of Christ makes it possible for us to receive our grace and to receive forgiveness of sins. So letter has four teachings, being united to God, that's the main point. It teaches about faith in Jesus, it teaches about caritas, and it teaches about divine filiation, which means you are a child of God if you are a baptized Christian. All right, we'll pick up with chapter one tomorrow. So this is just the intro to chapter one, or intro to first John. Have a nice day.